fairly muggy into Bank Holiday Monday in the south. As for Bank Holiday Monday, well, a great start across many eastern areas that will burn back to the coast later on. So it does mean many inland areas will see sunny spells develop, best of which will be in the west. And whilst there'll be one or two showers around, very few indeed, Andrew. Most of you, believe it or not, on Bank Holiday Monday will be sunny and warm. Enjoy. So it's been a very rough week in Brexit negotiations. Brussels has said no to our involvement in the Galileo satellite, no to our staying in the European arrest warrant, and above all, no to any all-British customs union answer to the Irish border. Many Brexiteers fear we are getting hopelessly bogged down. I'm joined now by Jacob Rees-Mogg, our next Prime Minister, say the bookies. Uh, welcome, <laughs> Mr Rees-Mogg. Good morning, and um, um, it's so nice to see you back. That's very kind of you. Um, you said this week that you were seriously concerned as to whether the government actually wanted to leave the EU. Why did you say that? Well, a lot of um, compromises have been made during the course of the negotiations. The government agreed to the EU's timetabling of the negotiations, agreed to a very large amount of money, and agreed to a transition period that included some things that we were told wouldn't be agreed. So on our side, we've made a huge number of compromises, and on the other side, as you just listed, nothing has come in return. And that makes me concerned that it's all very one way. But you've gone beyond that. You said the government itself may have lost the will, in a sense, for Brexit. Because it's difficult. And I was concerned that the withdrawal bill didn't seem to be coming back. Uh, that's now changed, that now that will come back in the middle of June. And I'm reassured in the last week. I think the government has made it clear that it is still committed. But there are concerns, inevitably, at the way the negotiations are proceeding. And we've heard this week that the, the Cabinet has apparently agreed that as a backstop to the Irish border issue, if nothing else can be agreed, we might stay in something very, very like the Customs Union for years ahead, 2022 or beyond. Would that be acceptable to you? That's a real problem because the Customs Union on its own does not solve the seamless border issue. If you go and look at the Turkish um, border, which is, is in a customs union. Alignment. Absolutely right. You require regulatory alignment as well, and that means the single market. And so if we were to stay as a rule taker, as a vassal state, for an indeterminate period, that I think would not be delivering on Brexit. And if you offer a backstop that is more attractive than anything that you're likely to negotiate from the other side's point of view, the backstop ends up becoming the front stop. So it's not acceptable. Um, we're running out of options on the Irish border at the moment. You've suggested two things. Can I ask you, first of all, do you think that John Thompson, who's head of the HMRC, is still a very capable man? I do think he's a very capable man. Um, whether his figure of £20 billion pounds for uh, the um, cost of administering Max Vac is right, I don't know. That would be 5% of our combined EU trade, and it seems a very high figure, and much higher than other countries, all than what we're already doing. Bear in mind, if it's like that, or anything like that, it puts Max back impossible. Well, I think, I think you want to go back to looking uh, at how we deal with goods coming into Southampton, and how that is managed by HMRC. The very low level of inspections, most inspections are done on food, and other inspections are intelligence-led. As food standards in the EU will be ones we're completely comfortable with, that level of inspection won't be needed. So I think you want to go back to where you're already doing sure. it, and already doing it successfully, and apply that. And I, I think so actually are, both MaxVac and the Customs Partnership have been a tendency to overcomplicate thing, over things. So there are problems with both of them. When it comes to the Irish border, you have said there is another answer, which is simply, if they are not going to negotiate seriously with us, we politely and courteously say thank you very much and we walk away. The trouble is, that is illegal, isn't it? No, it's not illegal. What makes you think it's illegal? Under the World Trade Organization rules, which we would certainly have to sign up to after leaving the EU, oh. then if there is a customs union on one side and us on the other, there has to be a border, and if there isn't, every single member of the WTO no. should take us to court. You're it's 160 Hold on. countries. Hold on. You're confusing two things, if I may. You're confusing a border with a hard border. There already is a border. There is a border for excise duties, there is a border for currency, oh. and there's a border uh, for currency, among other things. Right. But if you look at Article 24 of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, that has two exemptions that may be useful. One is for dealing with contiguous countries, and the other is in establishing a free trade agreement um, with, other, with a group. So we have a free trade agreement with the EU? Hold on, hold on. Patience. What you have to do is great virtue, and virtue is a grace, and grace is a little girl who doesn't wash her face, as I'm sure your listeners will want here. Um, but 
you can say we are working towards a free trade agreement, which we will be doing. And as long as both sides say this, you can then go on to say, and therefore we will, for an interim period, which can be up to 10 years, okay. we will maintain the current arrangements, and that's perfectly legal. And actually, I discussed this on one of the BBC's other programmes last week with an expert, uh, and we ended up agreeing that this was the case. Um, well, I'm no expert, I, as you spotted already. However, um, Sir Ivan Rogers, who was our ambassador to the UK, is an expert in these things. He has saturated himself in this for years and years and years, and he says the full EU regime will apply automatically, and that necessitates a hard border. Forget all the endless repetition of on the EU and Dublin's head be it, we won't direct a hard border, it would be their choice. That is simply legally untrue at WTO level. That's Sir Ivan Rogers. Well, I think you must have a look at um, Article 24 of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trades and then he will be better informed. You think he's simply wrong on that? Oh, Sir Ivan Rogers is the chap who did um, David Cameron's renegotiation and provided us with the thin gruel. I'm not sure he is the most impartial or useful commentator on okay, this well, issue. Let me try and find another impartial and useful commentator, the Prime Minister, because she's wrapped you over the knuckles over this very issue. She thinks that this idea of we are not going to put up a hard border, let somebody else do it if they dare, this kind of game of chicken is irresponsible and has said so much to you. The Prime Minister said in her Mansion House speech that she wasn't going to do this. I think that is a mistake. I think it is the obvious negotiating position for us to have. Bear in mind, the Irish economy is heavily dependent on its trade with the United Kingdom. It is overwhelmingly in the interests of the Republic of Ireland to maintain an open border with the United Kingdom. And I think if you're going into a negotiation, you should use your strongest cards. And just to tear one of them up and set um, hairs running on other issues is, I think, an error. OK, there's lots of errors that you think the government have made at this point, and things are, as it were, we're getting stuck in the sand. The wheels are whirling around and we're not moving forward at all. Are we now at the point where we have to walk away? No, I very much support the Prime Minister in her approach to remaining within the negotiations. I think it's important to obey the formalities and the courtesies, but I think we should be clear and stronger. Basically, the deal is very simple. We are paying a very large amount of money, £40 billion, and in return we want a trade deal. Everything else is essentially incidental to that. The £40 billion is of great importance to the EU because after March next year, it still has 21 months of the multi-annual financial framework. Mm -hmm. And it expects that to be funded by the UK. It would have to cancel projects or get more money out of the Germans if it doesn't get our money. But we've agreed to this already. Oh, no, we haven't because nothing's agreed until everything is agreed. And therefore we should reiterate that and say quite clearly, if we don't get the trade deal we want, you don't get the money. And that's a very and strong that, negotiating is, position. Is that a message for this summit? Do you think Theresa May should go and say, I know I agreed the 40 billion, but frankly, the way things are going, I'm changing my mind? I think it's worth reminding them that nothing is agreed until everything is agreed, which is clearly set out in the December uh, text, because the issues you mentioned, um, Galileo and so on, uh, the European Union thinks it's in a position of negotiating strength. Without our money, it faces a real crisis uh, next March, when it's facing problems from other countries too. If I were the EU, I might be a little bit more worried about what's going on in Italy than um, whether the UK can remain a full member of Galileo. That seems to be more important to the structure and the fortunes of the European Union. You have adopted a kind of demeanour of this, of kind of very, very punctilious and polite menace towards the Prime Minister. <laughs> There's no menace in me at all. There's plenty of menace I in you. The something. ERG has constantly got... said, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't... And then she goes and does it and you pull back, because actually you're a phantom army, you have no possibility of taking on the Prime Minister over any of this stuff, because you don't want Jeremy Corbyn. Um, well, certainly I don't want uh, Jeremy Corbyn. I do not approach talking to the Prime Minister in the way that you suggest. It's not for me to say, uh, you must not do this, you must not do that. I'm very respectful of the great office that uh, Theresa May holds. And presumably Theresa May herself. And her, whatever her she's course, doing, yes. she's working ferociously hard, right. night and day, long hours, to try and get this deal. And again, I say it's great respect, but it's relatively easy to do what you're doing, which is to sit at the back of the hall and chuck elegant wine bottles at her. But she is working really, really hard. Can I ask you, if she came to you and said, Jacob, I'd like to make you Under Secretary of State for this, that or the other, would you join her government? Uh, the Prime Minister is not going to be doing that. But, but if you um, did. Uh, but I want to but respond to what you've just said, because I agree with you. I think the Prime Minister is the most impressive and dutiful leader that this country uh, has had. Her expression of duty is something that all Conservatives should admire uh, and, and applaud. Um, I, I compared her recently to Geoffrey Boycott, who was my childhood cricketing hero, and I think that is her approach. It is a straight bat, it's a steady approach, 
and she if scores she's the so runs. Great. Why don't you ask to join the team? Because I think um, there are lots of other people who are very able, who are doing it extraordinarily well. You don't and think frankly, you're up to being an undersecretary of state? Frankly, if I were the Prime Minister, I would use my patronage uh, to encourage the pro-Europeans to keep them on board, because I'm going to back her in making sure that Brexit means Brexit from the back benches, and I'm very happy and keen to do that. And you'll back her, even if she brings to the House of Commons something like the full customs union backstop that you don't like? I, I will back the Prime Minister, uh, delivering all the promises that she's made in the Conservative Party manifesto, and in her various speeches, and in all the commentary she's made around it. Um, political gossip is a very different matter, and I think one can't work out from political gossip situations that may or may not happen. Everybody's against political gossip until they're really at the centre of what they want to do. Oh no, political gossip's great fun. I'm great. not against well, it, that's great fun, there. but it's not, it's not um, determined. Do you have what it takes to be Prime Minister? I don't wish to be Prime Minister. I'm very happy being a backbench member of Parliament. My concern... Can I ask my, you one question that you, ha you have, if I may say so, elegantly avoided up to now, but is a very important one. Are there any circumstances, whatever, in which you would challenge Theresa May for the Prime Ministership? Of course I wouldn't challenge Theresa May. That's a ridiculous idea. Um, no sir. The Prime Minister has my full support to remain as leader of the party. As I've said many times, my concern, my sole ambition, other than being Member of Parliament for North East Somerset, mm. is that Brexit should happen. That's what I want to support, and I want to support the Prime Minister and the Conservative Party and in delivering that. Is your message to the Tory party that if we get rid of Theresa May under any circumstances, that threatens the entire Brexit project? I, I think Mrs May is crucial to the Brexit project, yes. Um, can I ask you about the, 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 the story in the Mail on Sunday today? It's not quite political gossip, because Somerset Asset Management, um, which you set up, has invested very, very heavily in a whole series of Russian investments, oligarchs, friends of President Putin's. Now, just at this moment, when we are in such a difficult situation with Russia, do you think that's a kind of patriotic or happy thing to be doing? I, I no longer run Sunset Club Management's know. investments, and that's important to know. Uh, Sunset Club Management is an emerging markets investment management company. Uh, we manage clients' money. It's not our own money, it's clients' money. Mm -hmm. And they have asked us to invest it in emerging markets. We have a fiduciary duty to them to invest it as well as we can in businesses that we think will do well, subject to the law of the land. Uh, and that is, what, that is what we do. We can't run our investments on my political opinions. Uh, I think we should be much tougher on Russia. I think we should impose the level of sanctions that America has imposed on Isn't Russia. Isn't it awkward to um, be uh, making so much money from these investments while at the same time disapproving of them? You, you, you misunderstand you, how investment runs. No, I don't. I, 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 I understand I, exactly. No, I think I you, have moral authority, no. you have moral responsibility, You're at assuming, least, for what, the money that's coming into your bank account. You're assuming I make money from these investments. I don't. These aren't my investments. They are our clients' investments, who are mainly... You make money from some asset asset management, which makes money from these investments. Oh, but that's by, by second degree. Um, yeah. that our, our job is to invest in emerging markets for our mm -hmm. clients and using their money. We have to do that as well as we can under the law. We would be opening ourselves up to legal actions if we decided that my political opinions would influence the investments. That would be quite improper. In the new world after Brexit, we are going to have our uh, new alliances which will matter very, very much to us and above all with the United States. Uh, when you've seen what Donald Trump has said about what he wants to do in terms of pharmaceutical prices in the UK, he and his Secretary of State have said in terms they want to make British consumers and British patients pay more so that American patients can pay less. Do you not think that we are, as it were, taking back control from one side and losing it in another direction? Uh, no, I don't. That, um, Donald Trump is a very interesting political figure. And if you look at what he has said, he has made these very strong statements in um, what he sees America's interest to be. And then as we're seeing with the Chinese recently, he then negotiates deals uh, that leave everybody happy. So I we're think in that- a slightly weaker position than the People's Republic of China. Uh, um, of course, we're not as large an economy as the People's Republic of China. That's, that's absolutely correct. But we are the US's closest ally. That has a certain uh, weight to it. We are an important support for America and its global interests. And that again gives us uh, to counterweight to China, which is very often not of the same interest as the United States, that gives us a degree of influence. And I think the United States is a country that both makes sense for us to work with uh, and one where we have a lot of commonality of interest. Jacob rees thanks very much Thank for being with us today. Now, in the week that Harvey Weinstein was charged by the police in Manhattan, a new play by Joe Penwell has been gripping London audiences with its story of a powerful musician and his brutal treatment of a young woman singer. 
In Mood Music, Ben Chaplin plays a rock star turned record producer who is accused of stealing a younger star's music and of using his power in the industry to silence her.